I'm Albie Nessing from uh, University of Wisconsin. I want to welcome everyone to uh, this year's annual webinar on Alexander disease. Some of you may have been at our conference that we had in Madison last August uh, or watched the videos from that conference on the web. And, um, and so I'll say that, that today is not the place for a, a broad overview about Alexander disease. It's really just going to be an update on progress since really last summer. And, and most of what you'll hear today will be presented by Dr. Amy Waldman from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Christina Bowyer from Iona's Pharmaceuticals. Um, so in a minute, I'm gonna turn this over to, uh, to uh, Amy Waldman. But first, let me explain how the best way to ask questions for those of you who are using your computers, um, there should be a chat button at the bottom of the screen and you can type questions into the chat box and I'll be watching those and can um, relay them to Amy and Christina as necessary. For those of you who are calling in with your phone, you can always email me questions. Um, and my email address is a Messing, it's A N E S S I N G at W I S C dot E D U, and, and I can relay the questions um, as well. It, it may be that, you know, we haven't really done this using the Zoom program before. It may be that you can simply raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask, but with currently 94 participants, that may get a little bit. Um, chaotic. So we'd prefer if you use the chat box and, and email if possible. Um, I am trying to record this, so barring any technical glitches, uh, the discussion will be posted on the web for viewing by those people who can't uh, participate today. That might take uh, a week or so. Um, but I think that's all I have to say by way of general introductory comments. Um, Amy, it's all yours. Great, thank you, and thank you everyone. Uh, we know that this was short notice, um, and so I really appreciate everyone um, making time in their schedules. In a minute, I'm going to um, switch over to the slides, just so that everyone knows when I show my slides, I was not able to actually see the chat. So I'm going to be talking, but would really, I mean, I might play around with it to see, but I don't wanna mess things up too badly. I might not be able to see the questions that are coming in as I'm presenting. So Albie and Jerry, who you all know, um, will be monitoring many of the questions that are coming up as I'm speaking. So I'm gonna turn off my video um, as I switch to the slides now. Let's hope this works. Okay. Oh, I can still see my video, so. Uh, now I don't know what, did I, does everyone, can everyone see my slides? Let me make it big. Can you put it in slides, Joe? How's that? All right. Hopefully that works. Now I'm going to try just for a minute to shut off my, there we go, to shut off my video. And I'm going to sort of hide some of the other videos. So hopefully this is all working. Can everyone see it? Okay, Albie, can you, can you see the slides all right? Albie, we good? Yes, we're good. Oh yeah, I had muted myself. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so the, the only thing before I get started here, there are 97 participants on the call and that is amazing and fantastic. Um, the challenge is this will only, there's 98, this will only allow um, 100 participants. So I would kindly ask that if you are joining from multiple sources, could you please maybe hang up one of them, either you know, hang up your phone or um, hang up the computer. Um, and if you are calling you know, with friends and family, maybe you could even um, do it together in the same room. I know that's a little late if you're in different locations or maybe join if you are on a, a phone, join that way. Um, Cause we are, okay, great. We have, we're on 97. So hopefully and everyone who can join will be able to. All right, so the, um, really the goal of today is to first and foremost, thank everyone 
for their continued support. Oh, I don't know how we got lines on here. Um, can thank everyone for their continued support of our Alexander disease research study at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, the families have been tremendous in making their commitments and traveling to CHOP, um, mostly at their own expense. Um, I hope that you have really gained medical knowledge and knowledge about Alexander disease from coming to CHOP, and I want to thank everyone. I also want to thank our partners, Ionis Pharmaceuticals, Elise's Corner, and Grayson's Ladder, who funded the study, and I will talk more about that in a bit, and the Calliope Joy Foundation, who, who provides um, clinical support for our leukodystrophy center um, and had supported some travel for patients in the past. Okay, so to really kind of talk about what the goals for this call are, we started, I wanted to really just review the Alexander Disease Natural History and Outcome Measure Study. Um, it was important to me also to discuss openly funding for the study. There are many people, I think, on the call who called in this fall for an appointment and got a little bit of a, a stonewalling from us saying, oh, well, let us figure some things out. I'm not sure um, about the schedule. And so we need to kind of be, I want to be open and honest about what's been going on with the study and where we're at. And then, of course, we want to go over the goals for the year ahead. However, um, after we sent out the announcement for the webinar, um, we really couldn't ignore the webinar, the, um, the, webinar, the elephant in the room, um, and that everyone started to uh, really think that this was an announcement about a clinical trial, and there was a lot of buzz about that, and we really hadn't planned to talk about the clinical trial at all on today's call. Um, you know, but after a lot of things that have come up over the last day or two, we have decided that we want to just review um, as much as we can the drug development process and briefly address the clinical trial. So drug development takes many steps and here is a generic figure. Okay, so here is a generic figure about uh, the drug development process. And you can see that there is a preclinical phase which usually involves animal models and animal testing. And then there is also um, a clinical phase where we actually give a drug to patients, and those are called phase one, two, and three clinical trials. And then there's a post-marketing phase that occurs after that. And so we are in the preclinical phase now. And while the animal testing is going on, we at CHOP are working on the, the uh, natural history data. And so we are gathering data to determine a lot of the clinical features and imaging features um, and longitudinal progression um, of this disease. And you can say, see from this generic figure that the range is one to three years. The average time here you know, suggested is about 18, an 18 month process. And some of these steps can happen in parallel, but often they build on each other and must happen in series. So in parallel, we're doing the natural history study while the animal testing is going on but there are some things that have to occur sort of in sequence. And this is all involving Dr. Messing's research at Wisconsin in collaboration with IONIS, and of course our research at CHOP on the natural history. And so we've been working together on the ASO, the anti-sense oligonucleotide drug development plan for several years now. So I've said before that there is a timeline in place um, but I really hadn't want to share that timeline in detail because I worried that I'm, I'm being a little maternalistic here and I worried that, you know, if the timeline was incorrect, that we would be causing more anxiety and that, that until we were closer, didn't want to mention anything. And I want to reassure everyone, the activities to date have gone according to plan. Okay, so, but, you know, as I've been trying to avoid the specific details of the timeline, I've learned that Iona shared a key detail recently in a public forum. So Ionis has set a target to enter, the clinic, to enter the clinic approximately 18 months from now. So that's incredibly exciting. What that means is that the target goal is that the first patient would receive their dose in approximately 18 months. That's when the trial would begin. And I can tell you that this has been the goal and, and we've been on time and on target for many years now, we continue to work together, and I'm really hopeful that we'll continue to have success during this period and ultimately meet this milestone. However, I do want to give people perspective. The IONIS timeline graphic that's flying through social media right now has unfortunately been taken from an equally important 
graphic that describes forward-looking statements. So this is the small print, and it's really important in this situation that you understand it. There are risks and uncertainties that are associated with these projections. So if we hit them, that's great. But if we don't, then the reasons for failing to reach these milestones will define the next steps. And that's why there is this range of timeline in terms of how long the preclinical stage will take. So the, I can tell you that the bulk of the current activities are what are called IND, an investigational new drug enabling toxicology studies. Those are all being done in these animals. So essentially, IONIS has identified an ASO that might be suitable for clinical testing, meaning we can give it to patients, but it needs to go through a battery of tests in animals before we can give it to people. So there is a possibility that safety concerns emerge through this animal testing that will prevent us from moving forward with the human testing. On the patient side of things, once the trial is set, so once we know it's gone through the, gone through the animals and we have all of our safety data, we need, first of all, a, a clinical plan, which I'll go through in a few minutes, and then we'll need several months to prepare and submit and finalize the research documents with our institutional review boards that protect the research subjects. So while we want everyone to be hopeful, as we are, and we're very excited, you know, we want to stay on the timeline that results in initiating clinical testing toward the middle of next year. But we also want you to be aware that there are several hurdle, hurdles that must be cleared before then. So as always, we are doing everything that we can to facilitate success. And as we move through this pivotal next phase, we will aim to keep you informed on the progress. And that was really the goal of today's call is to talk to you about the clinical progress. So, so I, I don't have any control, in, and actually here, none of us have a lot of control over the preclinical animal studies. So we have to be patient. We have to watch these animals for defined periods of time, and th those studies can't be rushed. That's not a, that's a time game, sort of. Not game, but that's a time issue. Um, what we do have control over to some extent is gathering the clinical and research data that we need in order to, to inform the clinical trial, and that's really the goal of today's webinar. Okay, so I just, I've so shown this slide before and we're gonna build on it a little bit, but I want to uh, throw out there the concept of a natural history study. So in such a study that we have at CHOP, information is collected about all individuals who have a disease to provide a comprehensive understanding of the clinical, radiographic, genetic, and biochemical changes in the body. And we need to understand the relationships between disease variables and outcomes. So what I mean by that is, as many of the people on this call know, there's such variability in this disease. It does a clinical phenotype, the clinical symptoms that you have, determine your outcome? Does an MRI phenotype, the way your imaging look, does that determine your outcome? We need to understand all these nuances about the disease. Natural history studies are the foundation of rare disease research, but they involve an, a very active patient and family role, and I thank so many of you for participating in our Alexander Disease Natural History Study. I do have to acknowledge that there is this bias in the study at CHOP, because many of the people that have been able to travel, travel to CHOP um, have been maybe higher functioning, um, a certain age, um, have lived maybe close to CHOP, and so it's a little easier to get there. So I, as a researcher, have to acknowledge that my study at CHOP might not represent every patient with disease. So we need to hear from all of you, so all 100 that are on the call. If you have not been engaged with our research team, please let us know where you are, where you live, um, so that we can know where families are with this disorder. We need comprehensive data on all patients. Um, and for those that cannot physically travel to CHOP, we do have a telephone study that allows us to conduct interviews by phone and collect medical record, records and MRI scans. So I wanna start with how you can help. And I apologize, I don't know how I got this red line, but I can't seem to, oops, can't seem to make it go away. Um, 
First, how can you help? Please register with our research team. Jerry is on the call and has been a tremendous resource for so many families. And if it wasn't for her, we would not have been able to, we would not be at this, this spot um, at all. And I'll, I'll show you the numbers in a bit. Uh, Jerry has single-handedly been in touch with all of you and has coordinated all of your visits to CHOP. And I am so indebted to her for everything that she has done. And now I'm flooding her inbox. So I want to make sure that she knows how much I love her. <laughs> um, please note, though, I personally am terrible at email. Many of you have experienced that, and I apologize. Um, email is also not secure for medical advice. Um, we are discouraged very strongly at CHOP um, at using email because email is a private conversation and not part of the medical record. So if I'm making med changes and that's not in the medical chart, that causes uh, safety concerns. Um, but email is, of course, a useful tool for scheduling and communication and sending records if you have them. Please send all your medical records. And this is even for our established families. So some of you I, I've known and I have so much information on, but I might be missing, for example, the records of your child's development or a pediatrician form when from their birth, their growth chart. So I know the, where their head circumference is at their, during their teenage years, but I might not have it from you know, zero to three or uh, zero to 10 even. Uh, the neurology records and MRI reports and genetic results are all extremely important as well. And we need copies of all MRIs on discs. And many of our families have been wonderful about trying to track those down. Um, and we do have some resources and some people at CHOP that can help you if you just at least tell us where the scan was performed. Um, and we might need you to sign consent forms so that we can track down that data with your help. So here's my address, my phone number, um, and please do stay in touch with us. I also um, want to uh, ask if you could help us by completing some questionnaires. So this is uh, interesting in that many of you, I already know your story. I know your child or your personal story and your journal with, journey with Alexander disease. Um, but we created a questionnaire because we want, we need to hear it from you. You know, what if you have said to me, oh, the seizure started in 2017 and I wrote down 2007 by mistake. You know, these are diff different ways that we can just document that our records are correct. You know, in a busy clinic as we're typing, you know, I, I, there are uh, typos that occur. And so the more information we have, the medical records, a, a questionnaire from you, um, and of course my, my notes, the more we can reconcile that data and make sure that it's accurate. I'm also asking that people help us fill in the gaps for your child or family member. So for example, as I mentioned, the head circumference charts if your child is a bit older or out of that window now, you know, uh, most pediatricians don't measure head circumference past age three. So if you are in your later childhood years or teenage years or even an adult, and I understand that adults are gonna have a hard time getting their pediatric records and that's okay. But if you could help get us records, that would be, the, be very helpful to our team. And then I would say for your own benefit and for ours, if you could complete a care plan, and I, I made an example here, where you have the doctor's specialty, their name, Dr. Messing was laughing at my doctor's stomach colon made up <laughs> thing here. You know, the doctor's phone number, where they're located, what medi medications they're prescribing, when the last visit and the next visits are scheduled. And then notes for yourself or notes for your team so that you can say, hey, I wonder about asking my neurologist about vomiting, which is a major uh, symptom in this disease and one that's often neurologic and not actually from a more of a GI perspective. So I think just clinically creating a care plan is helpful for everyone and is not really a research tool here, just something that might help families. Albie, am I okay to keep going or are there some questions that are popping up? I think you're okay. Uh, Christine is handling most of them. Okay, great. Okay. So I do want to make sure that everyone understands the difference between a clinical and a research visit at CHOP. So just walking through this, for a clinical visit, this is a visit to a neurologist similar to what's happening at home. The goal is to understand your child or yourself and your symptoms, right? So you, you talk to the doctor about symptoms that are bothering you, and then the doctors tweak the medications or recommend some therapies to help with those symptoms. This care is billed to insurance. Families often have co-payments. Um, and I want to just remind everyone that usually, depending on the practice, you know, frequent visits, at least annually, are often required to continue to refill medications and provide medical advice. So 
if you haven't seen the doctor in several years, it's hard for the doctor to say, oh, you need to do this, this, and this. You know, things might have changed dramatically from your last visit. For a research visit, the focus is a little bit different. So the goal here is to address research-specific questions. It's not necessarily an individual-based approach, although for those of you who have, um, have traveled to CHOP, I, I do hope that you have gotten some good advice for your own child or yourself during those research visits, but really, you're, you don't get a lot of feedback from the research because we're collecting data. That's the purpose of the research visit. We are not the treating physicians, so we cannot prescribe medications in research visits. So for some of you who come only for research, it, when I provide an impression and plan, I will say the plan is research only, you know, rather than giving a medical opinion about what medications might be helpful for your child. So insurance is not billed for any research visit and there is no co-payment. So these are uh, free to you. Um, but on the flip side of things, the individual results are not always shared with the patient because of the unique aspects of research study design. So what I'm specifically referring to here is the spinal tap. So we've had a lot of individuals undergo a spinal tap and we've measured GFAP, but I'm actually not sharing the exact number, what a person's individual GFAP value was back with the family. This contributes to the overall knowledge of Alexander disease, but you don't necessarily get individual results. You do, however, get MRI results. So the MRIs have a clinical read. I read the MRIs, I review the MRIs with you, and that is included um, as part of your medical visit. And then follow-up visits are determined by the research protocol. Our protocol um, is requesting annual visits, and we work within 12 to 15 months of your, your 12, um, I'm sorry, nine to 15 months of your annual visit. So it doesn't have to be the exact same month every year, but we try to do it not sooner than nine months and not more than 15 months from your last visit. Again, the clinical visits at CHOP focus on many symptoms of Alexander disease, not just the neurologic. So I just jotted down a few here that have affected uh, many of you. And there's a lot of things that we can do and medications that we can recommend for these clinical symptoms. So this again is not part of the research, this is clinical. So vomiting is a huge uh, burden for many individuals with Alexander disease. It's a difficult thing to treat. And it's not just a GI problem, and not just a um, gastroenterology problem. Um, a lot of it is coming from the brain stem, which is affected in Alexander disease. So what I want people to do is, is don't limit the symptoms that you're sharing with us thinking that we can't help because in a lot of situations, we actually treat the non-neurologic symptoms in our clinical program. Before we go back to the research, I just want to uh, highlight a few other things. You know, at CHOP, we strive to eliminate barriers between patients and their care. And really, I'm referring to insurance restrictions. We recognize that Medicaid, especially state, um, well, they're all state-based um, insurance plans, will often not approve a visit to CHOP because you can get in-network neurology care. We, we do think that we offer some additional um, advice. Um, you know, but it's a little bit challenging sometimes to get insurances to cover you traveling all the way to Pennsylvania. Um, we recognize that, and in those situations, sometimes we are uh, left doing a research-only visit where we won't be able to directly provide you medical advice. But in those cases, if you've traveled to CHOP and I've gotten a chance to get to know you um, or your child and we have some medical information on you, I do feel comfortable working with your local provider to make some recommendations. So your local neurologist, pediatrician, internist, and saying, you know, I've met you through research. These are some things that I think might be helpful. But we need a local care team involved, especially in those cases, because it's not, I'm not able to write prescriptions or to do it, um, practice medical care across state lines. Um, we do believe in care coordination and referrals from local providers. We know that the referrals are often slow. The pediatrician doesn't understand why they need to put in a referral for a neurologist that's you know, thousands of miles away. And so we do our best to ask those pediatricians in their offices to take care of some of the um, paperwork that is required. Sometimes we cannot initiate the insurance. It has to come from your local providers, which becomes a barrier from time to time. 
Um, I also know that travel and traveling with equipment and medications and many other logistics can be challenging as well. And we do our best to reduce those barriers. And we have a social worker, Sarah Stoney, who many of you have been in touch with. Um, Sarah is amazing. She's an incredible resource for you and your family. Um, she's very responsive to email and phone calls, um, way more so than, than I am, and I admire her for that. Um, please know that she will do her best to provide you with whatever resources are available. So for example, in the past, um, we had, CHOP had been the recipient of some airline vouchers. Um, and there were rules and stuff that went along with that, but they, she was able to provide some uh, flights for certain individuals. She also, from time to time, gets hotel rooms donated, and there are some organizations that she can ask for that. But I should stress that resources vary widely due to external factors. So once we ran out of the, the um, airline vouchers, you know, we didn't have more to give. So please be patient and understanding. If you got airline vouchers one year and they're not available the next year, it is a, you know, obviously a limited resource one that we will tap into if it's available, and if it's not, there's little that we can do because these are coming from other organizations. For our international patients, for Argentina and Chile and Singapore and Turkey and Israel and UK and all of those other um, individuals on the line, um, we do have a global medicine department for our international patients. We work very closely with them to try to align um, our goals for your visit prior to you coming to make sure that it's really worth your while to make the trip. Okay, so enough about the clinic, let's go through the research. So I'm thrilled to announce that we've had 144 patients contact us from 22 countries. It has been an incredible three years and we're so grateful for all the families that have reached out to us. 58 patients have undergone testing at CHOP. So they've physically come to CHOP, they have gone through several days of physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech, swallow, um, evaluations, also MRI and spinal taps for those that have been interested um, in undergoing those optional research procedures. Um, of the 58, 25 have had at least one follow-up visit at CHOP. 33 of the 58 have undergone lumbar punctures at CHOP, so a spinal tap where we've been able to collect cerebral spinal fluid um, so that we can measure GFAP, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. And five of those patients have undergone more than one lumbar puncture for clinical and research pay, uh, purposes. So sometimes we've done it clinically because there was a clinical indication for it, and sometimes we have done it um, you know, for those 33 patients for a research procedure. Okay, so as we are thinking about the you know, next several years, we are going to be designing the clinical trial in Alexander disease for the administration of the antisense oligonucleotide. So we need to select what's called a primary outcome measure. How would you measure whether the drug is working? One question we have, the, the goal of the antisense oligonucleotide is to reduce GFAP. So one question is, do GFAP levels in the spinal fluid and blood change over time? Are they stable? Do they decrease with age? Do they increase with age? You know, we can make the argument that maybe they increase with age because the disease quote unquote progresses? Or do we make the argument that they decrease over age because your astrocytes don't produce anymore? I don't know, that's what's, um, that's what's one of the questions we're trying to answer in our clinical uh, program. For the actual trial, we need to pick a primary outcome measure, one specific clinical challenge for patients. This is not a GFAP level, a GFAP level is a biomarker. We need to pick a primary outcome, something that is relevant to the patient and captures how the patient feels or functions. So this is a challenge um, given the variability in symptoms and ages of onset. So how do we compare a baby to a teenager or adult? Um, and how do we compare people with different abilities? So this is really the focus of our work at CHOP is trying to define these outcome measures. This very complex slide comes from the FDA and we've adapted it for Alexander disease. This is all the work that we need to do prior to the trial starting. So we're here collecting the natural history data. We think that there might be some subpopulations, you know, by age of onset or by phenotype, but we really need to define everything on this slide 
prior to going to the FDA. So the healthcare environment, you know, that's not as important, but the patient and caregiver perspectives are incredibly important. You know, how would you define a success if you're giving a new drug to your patient? How are we going to define how your child or loved one feels or functions? What is the context of use? Like these are all kind of getting a little bit beyond what I meant to discuss today, but these clinical outcome assessments have been the focus of our program at CHOP for three years now. What we need to do is get into the treatment benefit and defining the outcome, and so we are moving into the analytic phase of our study. I wanted to show this slide. We had the opportunity to present to the FDA um, with the foundation from the NIH at the Biomarkers Consortium back in August, and Albie was there, and I was there, and, and, and um, Adeline Vandiver from CHOP uh, presented on our behalf. And we were presenting our data on using GFAP as a potential surrogate endpoint in Alexander disease. And this gets very complicated. All I want to mention here is that if you have Alexander disease and it causes an increase in GFAP, we are really looking at the being able to measure GFAP before and after the drug is given and hopefully demonstrate that we can decrease GFAP and that will improve the clinical outcome for the patient and their family, okay? So our goal now is to continue to measure GFAP. We have to show that we can do this with precision and accuracy, and we have to determine what other molecular responses might contribute to pathology. And we also need to really critically show whether GFAP changes over time in the absence of this ASO, as I was mentioning a few minutes ago, does this go up? Does it go down? Does it stay stable? So that we know and we can predict what's happened when the drug is given. Okay, I don't know how these red things are coming on there, but I'm, I'm not doing that. Okay, so although we are so grateful and so fortunate for all of the efforts that you have um, provided, the reality is that we only have 25 patients that have had longitudinal visits to CHOP and only five have undergone more than one lumbar puncture for clinical and research purposes, so we need more data. We can't go to the FDA with data on 25 patients and say it's representative, repre that it represents all 144 patients that we know of, um, and longitudinal data on five patients is not enough to design an entire clinical trial. So the challenge, though, is that as of a couple of months ago, you know, we, we didn't necessarily have the funding to continue an open-ended natural history study. So ideally, we would be able to welcome 144 patients from all 22 countries, put everybody through every procedure, um, you know, and we didn't, we don't have the funding for an open-ended natural history study. So we've been um, trying to increase our funding, and I'll go through that in a second. The other challenge is that we had some limitations at CHOP where our institutional review board was protecting families, like to their credit, they are protecting families and patients. And they said uh, to me, Dr. Waldman, you can only do a single lumbar puncture. These patients, the a spinal tap, these patients aren't benefiting from the spinal tap, even though the global, the global Alexander disease community is benefiting by us having this knowledge. They had initially said, we're not sure that we're gonna let you do more than one spinal tap in a patient. Please provide us with way more, much more data that this is safe and that this has been okay. So we went back to the IRB with data on our patients, said that people tolerated the procedure well, we haven't had um, significant side effects from the LP, we went with a lot of information on anesthesia and, and all kinds of, of data that they were looking for. And I'm pleased that we are almost in the final stages of getting their approval to do two spinal taps in Alexander disease patients separated by one year. So they agreed that the information was so vitally important to the clinical trial and we can't go to clinical trial without it. So they have agreed that we can do a second spinal tap in patients um, that are interested and willing to do it. It is still optional. It is not mandatory. You can come to CHOP um, and see us clinically or for part of the research and not do those studies. It was just important to me that the Alexander disease community understands 
that this is what we're trying to measure. Can you measure spinal fluid at one time point and a second time point and show that it's either changing or not changing over time before any drug is given? Okay, so I want to review our funding for the upcoming year. We are incredibly grateful for all the individuals on this slide, for Ionis Pharmaceuticals, Elise's Corner, Grayson's Ladder, the Brooks Coleman White Foundation, the United Leukodystrophy Foundation. Uh, we have funding from CHOP and CHOP-based grants as well, um, and families have been incredibly generous in, in giving their own money to help our research um, initiatives. So we are happy to report that funding has been obtained to keep the study going for another year. But each funding source has its own rules about how the money can be used. So the procedures at each research visit may differ depending on what data is needed for that research project. So for example, the goal, Ionis Pharmaceuticals has provided us tremendous support for longitudinal data collection, including in the past the MRIs and spinal taps, um, and now additional funding for us to get these longitudinal, these second spinal taps in our patients. Um, Elise's Corner provided, I think as many people know, the initial startup funds for this entire study. We would never be here three years later if it wasn't for the generosity of Elise's Corner in launching the trial from, or launching our clinical studies from the beginning. Um, they have now uh, committed some additional funds that are gonna be used to complete the FDA compliant database, data entry, and data analysis. So Grayson's Ladder generous, generously provided the startup funds for us to create FDA compliant databases. And um, Elise's Corner and Grayson's Ladder, without this support, we would not be able to collect the data in the manner that the FDA needs. So this is incredibly important and sort of a different goal for the upcoming year. We also need to start doing some data analysis, statistics, and other things to look at trends in the community. And again, that, that takes funding and time, and so we now have some support to start doing that. And we are very optimistic that that's going to lead to publications, which we look forward to sharing with you on future web webinars. The Brooks Coleman White and CHOP-based grants, those foundations are providing patient care costs. So there are costs associated with all of the visits, just because there's no charge to you doesn't mean there's no charge to us. So I'm grateful for the Brooks Coleman White Foundation um, and some funding from CHOP that we're able to cover some of those patient care costs. We are thrilled to announce that we got a grant from the United Leukodystrophy Foundation, and they're paying for the cerebral spinal fluid and blood GFAP analyses. So I just mentioned how incredibly important those are, and we have some funds now to cover that on the upcoming year. Um, and families who have given uh, money towards our initiatives, you know, a lot of that is donor driven. They get to choose um, how they want that money to be spent. Um, that's a little bit oversimplification, but it's so important. I do not know where all of these red things are coming from, but it, they're not bothering me, so hopefully they're not bothering anyone else. Okay. Um, so I put this back up because Many people are really not going to feel any difference in terms of where the money's coming from. The study procedures are, are going to look ma mainly the same. They might differ depending on what data is needed, as I mentioned, for that person, um, but a lot of the study procedures are gonna be the same. I do have to acknowledge, though, that the only difference that may be noticeable to the community is that we have the ability to provide partial travel reimbursement for some visits, but not for others. So depending on these funding sources, some of them come with travel support, but, but many of them do not. And so I worried about this and worried about the disparity that this would create. And it, it really, it came down to this. So either I accept the funding and offset the expenses for some families, or you know, we didn't accept the funding and then we can't offset expenses for anyone. So we ultimately decided that reimbursing some patients was better than none. And going forward, we're gonna to continue to seek all types of funding to keep the study going and support the incredible contribution that you are all making to drive Alexander disease research forward. So for those of you that might not be eligible for, your, um, for travel reimbursements, please do keep Sarah in mind because she can be a miracle worker and can make some things um, it can help with some things from time to time. It's not universal, it varies widely, as I mentioned earlier, but she's an incredible resource for everyone. 
Moving forward, we've applied for grant, uh, a very large grant from the NIH. The reviews are pending. Um, I'm not sure how our current government is going to impact how quickly we get those reviews back. Um, but funding from the NIH would be used to expand our program to multiple centers in the United States and others and other places. This is NIH grants, so it would be US-based um, to allow us to collect similar data to what we're collecting at CHOP. So instead of coming to CHOP, you might be able to go to a center closer to home and undergo the same study procedures. We also applied for a European Leukodystrophy Association grant. Unfortunately, this was not funded. But I do want people to know that I am looking outside the US. And so this would have allowed us to expand to two sites in Europe. And it unfortunately was not funded, but we will continue to keep our eye open for additional resources outside the US and additional grants that we might be able to apply for. Okay, so I've been talking for a long time. This is really your study. We are grateful for your time, commitment, and support. Please stay in touch and let us know early if you are planning a visit to CHOP for clinical or research purposes. Um, as I mentioned, we're incredibly lucky that we have ongoing funding for the study. Um, however, it is not unlimited. There are uh, specific numbers of patients we're targeting to enroll per year. Um, and if we reach that goal, then, then we would have to stop and we wouldn't, be able to incur we wouldn't be able to enroll people beyond that if we meet all of our goals until we find out whether we can get more funding. So if you do, even if you're not planning on coming till September or October or next year, if you're due for your annual visit, but you know that you are going to come, please let us know so we can start planning. Um, and uh, the last thing I'll say is just please be an active research participant, understand the study goals. Um, we have been so uh, blessed to be able to engage with all of you. We thank you for your time and your support and your travel to CHOP and your patience with me as I sometimes get back to you a week after you called. Um, but we are really grateful and want to thank everyone. Um, and I do need to thank also everyone at CHOP who has been so important to this research success. And so these are a lot of the individuals that you've seen. Um, and again, uh, to the families, to Ionis, Elisa's Corner, Grayson's Ladder, and the Clypey Joy Foundation, thank you so very much. All right, that's, the, that's all for me. Okay, so I think we can then turn this over to Christina. Yes, I just unmuted and I'm tr trying right, to sure. slide. All right, so I stopped sharing mine, so hopefully that works now for you. Oh. Can you see my slide? Yep. Yep. Okay, perfect. I just want to um, start off by thanking you so much and giving it, um, me the opportunity to participate and introduce Ionis and our patient advocacy philosophy. Um, my name is Christina Boyer. I'm the executive director of patient advocacy at Ionis. I've been with the company for tw almost 27 years. Um, and we're a company that specializes in development in developing antisense drugs that can treat a wide range of diseases. Advocacy is um, a relatively new concept in a lot of the across the industry. And I started this department um, about seven years ago um, with the objective to serve as a connection point between the patient community and the company. And we want to better understand the community that is affected by it so that we can better inform our research to create better development and regulatory strategies and ultimately create better. And I truly believe that we can only do this through partnership. Um, we focus on the issues that are critical uh, to patients and try to incorporate them into our internal decision-making process. So we believe that for good drug development, we need to start and end with the patient in mind. And we need to identify the aspects of health that affect that, sorry, aspects of health affected by disease that patients care most about and integrate that into the perspective of that perspective into our programs. And that's oftentimes what I'll refer to as burden of disease. That's what the, all of the information that's being collected in the natural history, and that is why that is so important, because every aspect of that is important. Um, our goal is to have an open and transparent relationship with the community, and we can only do that through partnership. And one way that we do that 
um, is similar to this event um, is by hosting regular updates. And this is an early stage development program for us. And right now I think we'll be able to commit to at least um, providing updates every six months. And as we progress in development, we'll provide more frequent updates, especially as we move closer, <clears throat> excuse me, move closer toward clinical development and clinical studies and actually throughout this year. Um, we regularly publish, <coughs> excuse me, we regularly, regularly publish information through community statements, which we would distribute through advocacy groups, and we would um, have them share that with all of their constituents. We would never want to hide any information, so I know that when the um, webcast information came out, there was a lot of chatter, but we would never, if there's something good to announce, we are always going to be the first to tell you, and our goal is to distribute any news and information that we have as broadly and as soon as possible. Um, we wouldn't want there to be lingering questions out there. And sharing us not only helps us, you know, be better in the design of our study, but it actually makes our studies more successful. So we are industry, but you should also feel free to ask us if you have questions. Um, and I'll be honest that we only have the answers that we have. Sometimes we don't have an updated answer to give you, and we will do our best to give you the where we're at in development, and as soon as we have additional information, we will share that. We are continue, um, we continually look for new ways to work with each of the communities that we support because we want to empower patient advocacy, patient advocates and communities to increase their ability to serve members through growth and independence. So us working with you helps meld our scientific knowledge with your burden of disease, and that is what creates innovative programs that help us clear help us carve clear development paths in order to lead to better medicine. So right now we're in the early stages of drug development that for Alexander disease, and we are excited to begin working with the patient community in the coming months as we prepare for clinical studies. Um, to, prepare, to prepare for future clinical studies, the IONIS team has been working diligently with Dr. Metzing on research and Dr. Waldman and her team on the natural history study at CHOP. This natural history study on Alexander's disease is very important because the data that is collected will help us design a clinical study. And that's what Dr. Waldman was telling you about. And we will be able to design a study that will quickly tell us whether or not our drug is working. Um, additionally, we've been working with CHOP on collecting information about your experiences as a patient and caregivers through surveys. And I know Dr. Wallman was talking about the surveys and the interviews that they're conducting. These are also important because they help us better understand the course of the disease and the variability between patients in order to better understand how a therapy can benefit patients. So I would encourage you to participate um, because every aspect of your diagnostic path, your disease burden, and everything that you've experienced to date it is very important. It gives us um, an opportunity to, to know, you know, to understand how many patients are out there, where geographically um, you are located, and to really understand um, the natural history of the disease. And in order to, you know, as Dr. Wallman mentioned, you know, we need so many samples to show FDA that a drug is working, our goal is to create the most efficient study in the shortest amount of time possible. Um, so if you wanna know how you can help us, I think this is one way um, that you can help us. I know many of you say, well, you know, your physicians already have a lot of your information and know um, your case, but we don't necessarily know everything about your case. And disease onset is a, a very important component of this disease. And I think capturing that information will help us um, narrow the variability, look at any subpopulations that may exist, as Dr. Wallman talked about, um, and help us identify clear endpoints that can expedite a study. So our goal is really to try to design the most efficient studies, um, and provide access, that will provide access for the broadest patient population. Um, another component of the natural history and all of this information, it, it will actually help us in creating awareness campaigns for disease. 
um, that we want to engage in to help us with earlier diagnosis so that maybe if you're not somebody that is being seen at CHOP, you're not that lucky, but there are other physicians um, across the country and around the world that are learning how important it is to diagnose Alexander disease early. If you are already um, participating in the natural study, I want to just thank you. Um, it's very, very important and we know it takes time out of your day and you're making visits and filling out forms, but they are very important in every aspect um, of the information that you provide is important to the design of studies that we're looking at. We very much appreciate your participation in these projects. In 2019, um, I hope to engage more with the community. We will actually um, be attending the United Lupus Dystrophy Foundation Conference in Chicago this June. And I would also like to put together um, a patient advisory board for that. So um, keep an eye out um, in the near, um, in the coming month, we'll probably be putting out information um, to get volunteers um, and recruit um, for that. And a patient advisory um, board meeting is really just an opportunity for us to get to know you um, a little bit more in person and understand the disease and what's important about the disease to you. I think um, I think that I was trying to answer some of the questions that came online as they were happening. Um, we will commit to regularly providing you updates. I think I can't see the chat questions right now while I'm talking, so I'll, I will um, get off of this in just a second. But I know you know there were questions about an IND and fast track, and we will absolutely do everything in our power. Um, to accelerate this program, but you know, sometimes we have to wait for the data that we are collecting, um, and safety is um, paramount. So, the safety that we're collecting, establishing safety in animals, is of the utmost importance. And so, that is something where you know that takes the longest amount of time. And to kind of put it in perspective, it's not just a a one and done in, a, in, a, in an animal model. You really have to have um, a specific duration of treatment in animals that shows that the animals are safe and that the drug is safe and that there are no signals that we should be aware of. And so while we're, we have recently said that we um, plan to initiate in 18 months, we will do everything in our power to, to commit to that, but we can't control what the data tell us. And so, unforeseen safety issues could potentially cause a delay, but we hope that that wouldn't be the case. Um, I just wanna say the urgency in which families are seeking a medicine for Alexander disease is deeply felt um, and shared by our team. It's in the forefront of our minds. We understand how important our work is to you and your family and your children's lives. And that's the core principle of our company. That is what motivates us. So we are here to do the best that we can to serve you. Um, and I just wanted to also create an opportunity that, you know, if you want to ask a question, feel free to ask us. Um, and we will try to answer you as best as we can always. And I think with that, um, I would turn it over to, to questions, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Christina. So um, people have been asking questions all along through the chat box, um, but let me just open it now to ask if people have others, other questions that they want to bring up now, or if Amy has any other final comments she wants to make. Yep. So I think I just started my video again. So I see some questions that are coming about getting some of the research uh, procedures done locally. So I'll start first by um, the spinal fluid. So it is much easier on families to get an LP locally, a spinal tap locally, rather than traveling to CHOP and getting it done and then flying back home. The challenge is that we have research dollars that we cannot share with other institutions. So I can't take money that was given to CHOP and give it to somebody else to perform the procedure. So if it's done locally, there needs to be a clinical reason that it's, that it's being done. So for example, 
your child is starting to have headaches. We've had some kids that don't complain about headaches, but just do this, and they rub the back of their head, which makes us think that, that maybe they're having a headache and they can't articulate it. Or maybe we're measuring the opening pressure, or maybe your child's head size has, has increased, um, and there's some questions. So if there's a clinical need to get the LP done locally, the spinal tap done locally, um, that's, that's the first hurdle in, in then getting insurance to pay for it, because then it's not a research procedure, it's a clinical procedure. The other challenge is that you actually have to have a way to process the spinal fluid the minute or, or very quickly after it's removed from the body. So often after a spinal tap, you collect the fluid, it goes to the lab, it sits there and they process it, and that's fine for those purposes. For our purposes, we need these processed immediately. So they have to get put on ice, and then they get, get spun with something called a centrifuge, and then we have to take off the cells and put them into new tubes that are low-protein tubes. So there's, there are a few extra steps. Clinical labs won't do that. So then we need to find a research lab at the institution that will do it, and research labs won't do it without funding. And then, even if we get through those barriers, then you have to ship the spinal fluid to CHOP. And these are, again, very precious samples. In this cold weather, not as big of a deal that we don't have to be maybe as, we still have to be very careful, um, but in the hot months, that's gonna destroy the sample. So then what we do for every time of year is we get these very special insulated box that are very costly, and shipping samples internationally costs about $1,000. So that's just a resource that we really don't have. Um, and so it, as, We've tried a few times, and some of the people on this call know, to get local LPs for those that needed them clinically, and it hasn't been all that successful. So I'm hoping you know, that, that we can streamline that. Part of our NIH grant, the goal of that grant is to be able to set up those uh, processing and shipping methods at multiple institutions. But that's a you know, multi-million dollar NIH grant, and we're waiting on those reviews and have to determine whether that even is, is funded by the NIH. So right now, as much as I would love for people to get things done locally, the spinal fluid is going to be challenging. On the other hand, blood is often not as challenging. It's a little bit easier to work with. One of the things that we could think about is sending you a kit. Um, again, we have to figure out the logistics of shipping it um, that you would take to a lab and have them draw it. We are thinking about that. You know, if we got 144 plasma samples, even though it's not spinal fluid, that's still a very rich data set that we could use. So we will work on that. Um, as for some of the other things, the um, physical therapy and occupational therapy, speech and language, some of those are standardized measures. So most therapists, again, should know how to do a lot of those procedures. Again, however, when you're doing a, when you're going to see a physical therapist, they're not always putting you through those standard measures. They're just creating a treatment plan for your child. So there's a little difference between a physical therapy, for example, evaluation and a research physical therapy evaluation. Again, there's a different clinical focus versus a research question and need. So we're trying to understand all of that, and and but it's just not easy to implement or implement a research protocol at other places. You know, one of the things that we're so desperately trying to understand is what does impact disease progression so that we can determine, we can predict it, and then we can determine the best way to measure it. Um, I think that answer is, it's obviously a very complex answer. Age at onset, um, age and time to certain symptoms um, is another key factor that we're investigating. Um, MRI phenotype, so we've, we've seen five different MRI patterns in Alexander disease, and we can start to sort of cluster patients by what I'm calling their MRI phenotype. That's something that we hope to publish in the near future, is looking at these different MRI patterns, and does the MRI pattern drive the age of onset? Of course, an MRI doesn't drive clinical, they, they, they go hand in hand, um, and so that's a little bit of a misnomer saying that the MRI is gonna drive the clinical, the clinical manifestations are because of where the MRI pathology is visible. But these are all the things that we're trying to understand with the data that you have uh, provided to us. Plus, I'll add um, genetic modifiers. So, yes, you know, that's certainly a major research interest. And I think 
is something that you'll be able to follow up in the future with the blood samples that people are continuing to, to give you. So Barb, your question is not rude at all. It's not selfish at all. And I understand the question, you know, are we focusing on um, children? Are we focusing adults? Are we focusing on everybody? All of us on this call very much wish that, that any new drug could be given to anybody who wanted it and that we would be able to help everyone in the community. Um, of course, that's not the way this works. And I can't resist, I'm sorry to those Patriots fans and everybody else on the call, but I have to give you my Eagles analogy, right? So the goal is to win the Super Bowl, right? That is the ultimate goal. And for us, that means that everyone gets drug because it's FDA approved and it's paid for by insurance and it's available to families. So the goal is that this drug is available for every patient everywhere. That is the goal. As in the Super Bowl, you know, only 11 players at a time are on the field in order to show that you're gaining yards and moving the ball. We need to design a trial um, based on the information that we have, you know, and the information that we have um, and the longitudinal information that we have. So we need to show the FDA that if we give somebody a drug, we are going to make a short-term change. And so we're going to design a trial that we're going to be able to show that that can be measured. So there are challenges with every age group. There are challenges with giving a drug to children, there are challenges giving it to teenagers, and there are challenges giving it to adults. And the goal of the time over the next um, several months is to think through all of those challenges and figure out the best way to advance the ball to score that touchdown so that the drug is available for everyone. CHOP does accept foreign patients. Um, it's saying if we go to CHOP for clinical treatment. So for clinical treatment right now, we are treating all of those symptoms, including loss of muscle tone, and I think someone wanted me to add. Um, we're treating all of the clinical symptoms of Alexander disease, and we, I think, um, can help a lot of patients feel better now and not necessarily wait for an antisense oligonucleotide treatment. Um, and I did see some questions in the chat. Your participation in, at CHOP is completely voluntary. It does not determine whether or not you are eligible for the trial once it launches. And once it launches, what we will be doing is sharing the eligibility criteria. So we, there are going to be predetermined rules of who can get the drug based on the longitudinal data that we're able to collect and based on the um, complicated statistics that go into determining whether we can predict change. And so that's why the clinical trial will be designed and then anyone who is eligible that meets those eligibility criteria that are gonna be predetermined will be eligible for the trial. Okay, Amy, so there are two yeah. questions I'm gonna um, weigh in on. One is just a follow up to my comment before about genetic modifiers, what I was referring to were um, variants in other genes, other of the 20, 25,000 genes in your genome besides GFAP that might influence the, um, the course of disease in Alexander disease. So um, we think there's a very, um, there's very strong evidence that genetic modifiers exist. We just don't know what they are and we'd like to find out. Um, there's also a question about whether LP is the only method to find out levels of GFAP. Uh, and right now, we think it's the most reliable method, but there's a lot of interest in trying to learn whether blood would give you enough information um, that it would substitute for the LPs. But we're a long way from really knowing the answer to that question. Okay, so there's a couple of other things that some people have asked. So I did mention clinical symptoms. We mentioned vomiting. You know, there is a, um, a question about whether the gluten-free diet makes a difference for patients. There's no medical evidence that the gluten-free diet is, um, um, that makes a difference in Alexander disease. Um, I know several patients whose families have chosen that, and it has, their patients have, or their children and loved ones have done well on gluten-free. I need to balance those comments though with the fact that a lot of children with Alexander disease have failure to thrive. Um, and 
not as many of the adult forms have the failure to thrive, but failure to thrive means you have trouble gaining weight. And so we really are interested in a lot of high calorie foods for those individuals and sometimes even something called a G-tube, so a way to provide nutrition for those children. So we, I think we always have to balance, um, you know, trying a different diet with what does your child like to eat and is that particularly making you sick? A lot of this disease involves the brain stem, which is the vomiting center. And so a lot of the vomiting is coming from that. You know, I would say it is a personal decision, not a medical one, to try the gluten-free diet. Certainly, patients with Alexander disease don't necessarily have celiac disease, but some might. Celiac is a very common disorder, so celiac uh, disease might also affect your loved one because it's an anti-inflammatory disease that's pretty common. So there aren't specific, you know, herbal medicines. There are not specific um, diets that we recommend. I've gotten a lot of questions recently about CBD. That's the marijuana oil that people have been using. You know, I have some concerns about that. First of all, we all have to identify the fact that it is not um, approved for anything other than a specific epilepsy, and there are laws regarding using CBD. And so I am not advocating that you use those oils for your child. If you choose to do so, please, however, Share that with your medical professional because it does interfere with a lot of drugs. The other things that um, you know, we, we have to determine is really what are the long-term effects of using that? Just because it's a natural substance doesn't mean it doesn't potentially affect the brain. You know, there have been concerns in multiple sclerosis about brain atrophy that is accelerated by the use of at least street marijuana. So there's a lot of information that we need to gain about different diets, herbal medicines, and other natural substances. Um, GFAP is a research test. It is not available clinically. That's why we cannot share that. So um, the, um, there, there are laws and rules, and it's very strictly regulated that if you get a clinical test, your test would be the same if you went down the street to LabCorp or Quest or some other institution. So those are called CLIA certified labs. GFAP is not a CLIA certified test. It is done on a research basis only. So we need to show that we can measure it, like I said, with pre precision and, and accuracy using commercially available kits. So this is something that's commercially available, but it's not CLIA certified. And that gets a little bit nuanced but that's why um, we can't share those results. Someone asked about our um, ongoing studies on a new rat model of Alexander disease. We're very excited about the rats, but I don't really have any information that I can share at this time. Okay. I think we've maybe exhausted everybody's questions or saturated their ability to absorb the answers. Um, as I said, we will uh, try to finalize this recording and post it on the web within uh, a week or so. And um, feel free to contact us with any questions by email um, in the future. Thank you, everyone. We hope to see you at ULF this summer. Bye. Thank you.